um, I've got a very experienced guest with me who qualified as an Ex Alexander teacher in 1986 and has been teaching Alexander teachers since 1990 and is now head of the Alexander Teaching uh, Training Institute uh, in London. He runs his own Alexander business, of course. Um, he has qualified as a psychotherapist in 2000 and prefers the formative psychological approach, which I think we'll have to come back to later so that I understand it a bit better, and is a specialist in somatization. So a lot of things which overlap with the chiropractic, osteopathic, and physical therapy approaches. His name's Anthony Kingsley. Anthony, welcome to the studio this evening. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Now, I warned you I was going to be rude about Alexander Technique when we started, in only to say, to the detriment of the osteopaths and chiropractors, that lots of us perceive the Alexander Technique as being the preserve of the, the wafty, vegetarian, head-in-the-clouds, hippie um, types. But actually, it's got a good foundation and it's got a proven track record, hasn't it? So could you give us some background on the, what the technique is itself? Well, it first of all, I've had a haircut. I've taken off my Birkenstock. <laughs> Did you have some I, meat? I've had a few hugs of trees, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. And you're not wearing sandals, so that's good. Yeah. But it's, what's the background for the Alexander Technique? Well, it's over 100 years old. Uh, it was uh, formulated by uh, an Australian actor and reciter uh, called Frederick Matthias Alexander, uh, late 1800s. Yeah. And... The story goes, he was reciting on stage, as was his profession, and he kept on losing his voice. He went hoarse. And he tried all the usual remedies available, tried uh, resting his voice, tried um, sucking lozenges, uh, throat tinctures. Um, to cut a long story short, nothing really worked for him. And... Um, after getting to the point where he was terrified of losing his profession, he decided that there must be something he was doing to himself. There must be something that he was actually activating within himself that was causing trouble. So he was quite an obsessive sort of character. What he did was he put um, about six or seven mirrors around a room and watched himself in the act of reciting. And this is a condensed story, but I'm going to condense months and months and months of self-observation. He decided he had to look at what he was doing to himself that was contributing towards this constant hoarseness, irritation of his vocal cords. And what he discovered was that when he recited, he was efforting himself in order to project his voice from one side of the auditorium to the other, and if I can demonstrate, he was doing something like, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, yes, friends, Romans and countrymen. There so, was a, a, an effort of the yes. whole gesture, the whole mind and body system. Yes, and when you did society. that, we could see the scalenes, exactly. uh, prominence and, and yes, so on. Yes. Yeah. Now, the usual way that the Alexander story has been narrated is very much on the physical side, mm. now, as you very kindly said a few words about me at the beginning. I'm particularly interested in the psychological narrative as well uh, because the, the, uh, the Alexander technique is based on what Alexander called psychophysical unity, mind-body unity. And the mind-body is part of the same system. So we can speculate that when Alexander was reciting, he wasn't just trying to project his voice, which was part of the early narrative, that maybe he had stage fright. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wanted to hold the audience's attention. Maybe he was terrified. And so what we do when we're feeling out of control is get a sense of being in control. And that usually involves the, the voluntary muscle system. So you can imagine, you feel a bit out of control, you hold on. And that increases muscle tone throughout the body, specifically in the, in the throat and right. neck region. And how did, he, how did he know that what he was doing wasn't necessary to project his voice? Because I presume other people were doing the same thing, were they? Or did he just try to establish a system whereby he was using less effort to achieve his, his aim? Well, he experimented, and this took months and months and even years to perfect, but what he discovered was when he prevented the tightening of the neck and the retraction of the head into the spine and the compression of the vocal cords and the compression of the spinal column, his voice started to become more resonant. And eventually, 
he solved the problem of repeated hoarseness. So he realized there was a functional, a functional shift when he changed the patterning of his neck and head and back and also managed the stress component of speaking because the two things go side by side. Yes. He thought originally it was postural, but if he actually changed from this efforting to something more like this, that was the solution. So the original idea was the solution to Alexander was a postural solution to solve a postural problem. Now, some people still think the Alexander story is a postural solution to a postural problem. I confess I, I, I was one of them until about a minute or two ago. I'm glad because whenever I go to a party or a social event and I say I'm an Alexander teacher, 99% of the people I say it to go, oh yes, is it about this? Or right. sorry, I've got to sit up straight and they all do the same thing. So, yeah, well, they, don't, they do it with osteopaths as well because I mean, <laughs> as soon as they know that you're a medical practitioner of any sort, they sort of correct whatever they think is the problem that's you're looking right, at. That's they? right. They think straight yeah. spines is the answer. Yes. Uh, un uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy as that. But that was the beginning. That was the window into Alexander realising that there was something going on around his neck yeah. and throat and muscle tone and stress patterns that was contributing to his hoarseness and when he managed to neutralize those patterns, his voice improved. Interesting, I had no idea it had started with voice projection. I had assumed it had started with some sort of physical pain which had led to this concept of posture being the answer. No. Um, Did he develop it into something more wide, wider, widely applicable? At the beginning he was known as the breathing man or the voice man and people were sent to him who had vocal problems. So yeah. it did start off as a, as a technique for actors, reciters and people mm. that use their voice in public. Cool. And then afterwards, after he'd been doing this sort of specific work rather than general work uh, for voice people, he also realised that it had other implications on general health, on yeah. general functioning which surprised him because he thought originally, this is for my voice, I'm going to improve my voice, I'm gonna get along just fine. And he then realized that the improvements were taking place in the whole of his health system. And uh, that was quite a surprise to him. And from that moment, it started to generalize outwards into a, a holistic system, a general system. Yeah. But that wasn't the beginning of the real Alexander technique. This is the beginning of 1900s when he was actually talking to people from one corner of a room to another saying, I want you to do this with your neck, I want you to open your shoulders, I want you to lift your spine, I want you to open up your neck, and so on, with verbal instructions. Around 1917, yeah. the story goes, he got very, very frustrated with the impact of these verbal messages and realized that he was giving messages verbally that people were not translating in the way he wanted them to be yeah. understood. The problems of semantics was, was, was looming. And in a moment of frustration, he said to this particular person, no, not like this, and went over with his hands and said like this, and started rearranging them with his hands. That was the beginning of the Alexander technique. Right. The early stuff was semantically a disaster because no one really understood what he was trying to get them to achieve. They would interpret it yeah. based on their own sensory mechanisms usually in a rather haphazard way. Yeah. But the technique was born the moment Alexander placed his hands on someone and started to guide them non-verbally. Yeah. And at that moment, the technique was really, really created and it became a hands-on technique because non-verbal guidance bypasses all the potential for misunderstanding on a verbal level. You talked to me earlier about the importance of your palpatory skills as an Alexander teacher. Yes, although um, I didn't use the word palpatory. No, of course, so that's how I'm yes. using that for the benefit of our audience. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. Is, is, do you, is that something which is particularly refined? In a, Absolutely in a right. It takes a minimum of three years of 16 hours a week approximately 1,600 hours of training over three years. I was going is, to come to this because yeah. the Alexander training yeah. course that you run, three years long, three that's year a hell of a long course. course. Yes. And at the end of it, is there a teacher training qualification as well as an Alexander training qualification? Is no. there so after three years, you, are, uh, you pass it, you've attended, you've developed the necessary skills, you yes. are considered uh, appropriate to go out onto, uh, onto the market as an Alexander teacher. That's a, a heck of a long time. It's a huge amount of time. And the uh, registered Alexander training courses in this country and worldwide uh, uh, suggest that 
each course should have a minimum of 80% practical. Right. So not just 1,600 yeah. hours and half of that can be anatomy and physiology and uh, ergonomics mm. and so on. No, 80% at least should supervised be practi practical. supervised practical work with two, three, four trainers in a school yeah. doing, working with the apprenticeship model. Okay. Alexander Training is the apprenticeship model. It's actually hands-on pretty much throughout the day. So out of curiosity then, how much does it cost to train to become an Alexander teacher? Uh, at the moment, it's about £2,000 a term, so £6,000 a year over three years. Right. And I ask this with a slight, a bit of an agenda, but cool. if it's three years long, does that mean that somebody is now seeking to make it a degree qualification? We haven't gone down that road yet. I think it'll probably happen. A lot of mm. courses are now moving in the direction of uh, academic validation, and I can see it happening. It's the problem um, will be you will then find that you get less of the practical because you will have to do more academic stuff, which the, is possibly less relevant. I hope it doesn't happen yeah. in that way. In fact, I'd be happy for it not to be a degree course because I do know we will be pushed into yeah. modules uh, where the practical side will be diminished and the intellectual written side will be increased and I yeah. think we will suffer hugely. So I am, I am greatly in favour of the way Alexander has been taught since 1932, which is... 80 yeah. to 90 percent practical where you develop the hands-on what you call palpatory skills to a very very highly tuned level and I really would hate that to that that um, emphasis to be degraded at all because it's necessary you can have all the knowledge in the world about anatomy mm. and physiology and you put your hands on someone it won't, won't, won't help you at all I was in, interested to hear that as well because earlier on we, did, we had a quick discussion before we came on camera and you said, well, there's no point asking you detailed anatomy and physiology questions because as an Alexander teacher, you don't need to know that. Not at all. And it's not part of the training. In um, fact, a certain amount of knowledge will probably be a hindrance. I don't really want to know about the anatomy of the, of the digestive system or the breathing mechanisms. I don't really want to know too much about the neurological network. I don't want to know too much about the anatomy of the knee or the ankle mm. joint, or the shoulder. Because? Because I don't want to think about those things when I put my hands on somebody. So I don't want to be drawn into a part. I, want to, I yeah. don't want to, if you watch me, and I just demonstrated it, I don't want to be drawn into a part. Because yeah. my hands change quality if I concentrate, if I stare at my navel, if yes. I get really interested in something, I concentrate, the word concentration, it becomes a narrowing of focus. The palpatory skills that we develop as Alexander teachers is based on a certain quality of touch that can only happen when I'm in a certain state of, today we call it mindfulness. That's a sort of an overlapping idea. In other words, the quality of my nervous system will be communicated when I'm in a certain state and it'll be diminished or disturbed if, for instance, I'm stressed out. This concept of mindfulness, um, and I presume that as a psychotherapist, you've got a sort of a deeper understanding of that than, than many. I wish I'd have been taught mindfulness on my psychotherapy training, but I wasn't. But it, it, it's but, interesting for me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems to have become very fashionable yeah. recently, and, and yeah. lots of people are talking about mindfulness. I wonder whether they're all doing the same thing or even worthwhile things. And I have to say, I'm slightly put off by it because it seems to have become a buzzword for everybody. What, what, yeah, well, I, what actually I'm, do you understand by that, that term mindfulness? What do you well, mean? I, I, first of all, I agree with you 100%. It's become a, the buzzword today, the same way as maybe 30, 40 years ago, the buzzword was stress. Yes. Um, and each decade, there seems to be another buzzword. So I, I think the, the reason I used mindfulness is because it's very much in vogue. And my Alexander training doesn't profess to teach mindfulness. However, we are teaching a certain quality of thought. This is Alexander terminology, a certain quality of thought that is at the same time still and undisturbed and alert. It's very difficult to describe in words the certain quality of consciousness or being that the Alexander teacher has to develop. Mm. But the Alexander teacher, in order to pass on and communicate through touch, a quality of ease, acceptance, release, facilitation for change from one person to another, it's very, very delicate. And I can tell you what doesn't work. So if I'm in a state of trying an effort, my hands will convey forcefulness or even violence. If my hands are in a state of ease, they can only be, become communicating of ease 
if my internal state is one mm. of these. So for instance, this is why it relates to the Alexander story. The Alexander story is about a man who was not at ease when he was projecting his voice on the stage. Yeah. He was trying. So the idea in Alexander is we, we, we work towards not trying, or Alexander called it non-doing. These words may be familiar if you have studied Zen at all, but uh, they, they've been around in Alexander for a long time. And Alexander, Alexander didn't use the word mindful. He used words non-doing, and he used another word, inhibition. Not Freudian inhibition, but neurological inhibition, as distinct from excitation. And yes. the key for Alexander was when he was watching himself in a mirror, many, many, many months and years after he was looking at the postural mechanism, he realized that if he could develop a capacity not to react to the desire to speak well, if he could keep his stillness and his nervous system quiet and undisturbed, he was able to speak very, very effectively. And you can imagine that's, that's a holistic way of thinking about the human organism. And it must be very difficult to achieve as well when if the, the art of projecting a voice is a forceful thing. We think of it yes. as a forceful thing to do. Yes. Isn't it? Well, I think if you've done any sport at all, you know that if you try very, very hard to hit a really strong tennis shot at match point, you probably won't do as well as knocking up. Well, it's that effortless it, quality yes, of ease yeah. that only comes yeah. through non-trying. Yeah. And that's the paradox. Trying too hard to, to get the shot doesn't work. Trying who, yeah. so hard to hit the high note doesn't work. So if there is a par paradox there that is actually yes. very real. It is, actually, it's my own personal only exposure to Zen is the Zen art of tennis. I think there's a book written on the Zen art of tennis, it's isn't there? It's a wonderful book. And, I, and, I am tennis, a, and I am yes, a crap yes. tennis player, but I can remember occasionally when I wasn't trying to serve the ball properly, actually it would go where it was meant to go. But uh, that's a, that is a different yes. story. You've got nine terms at your nine um, terms. school, yeah. Yeah. and of that, 80% is practical, but there's, there's a certain amount of theory in there. Are there certain specific um, disciplines which you cover in that, those nine terms? Or? Well, the only discipline is the Alexander Technique, but we will cover a number of other modules. So How do you break it up? So on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday, we'll have a module. This term, it happens to be on, on anatomy and physiology and, uh, and um, the workings of the human organism. Uh, today, for instance, we had a, an osteopath who came in and talked to us about uh, homeostasis, okay. about the healing, the natural healing capacity of the, of, of, of the human body. Who was that? Who came in? <laughs> she was called Sophie Wrights. No, I don't know, I don't know Sophie. No, no, I don't know Sophie's watching. But, for the um, British yeah. School of Osteopathy. Good for her. Yeah. Okay. So, so but you said anatomy and physiology wasn't something you wanted people to concentrate on too, too much. much. So much more on the general principle yeah. of if we get out of the way, if we prevent interferences, Feeling slightly insulted, actually, because if you'd wanted more detail, you wouldn't have got an osteopath, you'd have got someone else. But I, think, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, that, that's the, 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 the main thing, is yeah. the idea, the, the principle behind it, which is if we get out of the way, because Alexander yeah. teachers don't heal. What we believe is that if we help a person stop interfering with their own organism, mm. the organism has an innate capacity for self-healing. Yeah. And those words will resonate with osteopaths and chiropractors yes. and physiotherapists, yes. because they all do the same thing. As were some of the things you said earlier on, because you talked about stillness and you talked about um, ease, and mm. particularly cranial osteopaths and the chiropractic equivalent, I imagine, will recognize those terms. Have you worked with cranial mm. or sacral occip occipital um, practitioners in the past? I mean, do you feel there's a, a some sort of overlap between the two? Yes, we're dealing yeah. with a human organism, we're dealing with human nature. So but in a very unforceful manner. In I mean, a very a unforceful of... manner. I don't feel pushed or pulled. I've been to one or two cranial osteopaths over, over the yeah. years and I have deepest of respect for their skill. Yeah. How many schools are there for learning the Alexander Technique? Seven or eight in the UK, something like that. All in London? or No, probably about four or five in London. There's a school in two schools in Brighton, a school in Manchester, uh, then there's a school in Devon. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Of a similar size, how many students are they churning out per year? Well, so, teachers are they churning out per year, well, I should our say. Our school has got uh, 16 students at the moment. Um, the school, other schools will probably have between 5 and 15, something like that. Uh, most schools would have at least four or five students. Some are quite small and they, they operate from 
uh, people's houses. Yeah. And uh, we operate from um, uh, a dance studio in central London. Okay. And presumably, if people want to find out more, then you have a website they can go to. That's right. Yes. Which is? Which is alexanderteacher.co.uk. Okay, good. Um, we've had some questions come in. Um, I'll have to read them because they're quite lengthy. Okay. As osteopaths, we're taught first to medically assess the patient to see if osteopathy is appropriate and then to work as an osteopath using our, it says, placatory skills. I think it means palpatory skills and osteopathic diagnosis. Is it not dangerous for purposes of differential diagnosis and appropriate treatment not to know the anatomy and physiology? Okay, great question. So we have uh, some sessions uh, that we call red flags. Okay. And um, I would say that an Alexander teacher would normally, at the beginning of meeting their pupils, we call them pupils rather than patients, because it's a learning experience, it's education rather than <coughs> treatment, you would ask them a number of questions. And um, if there are any particular red flags, I would say it would be very important to suggest to the pupil, have you seen your GP? Have you had yeah. this checked? I've got someone comes in, I've got a strange pain here. Well, is it just stress? Is it just muscle tension? The Alexander teacher is trained not to say yes, and to use that word placatory. Yeah. I would hope that the Alexander teacher would never placate mm. any symptom that he doesn't understand, ever, because you're getting into a minefield. I've got a pain in my spine. Have you had it checked? What do we know? It could be a tumour, it could be a neurological, what do we know? Nothing. We don't want to know. But what we would always do is assess, have you had it checked? If in doubt, go to a doctor, get an assessment. If at the point of uh, diagnosis, you're told everything's fine, go home, then I'm very happy to see them. Okay. Is it, is it not a, a bit of a risk though? Because if someone comes to you and they've got a pain in their back, mm. they don't know, do they? So leaving the decision with them is a bit risky. Do you teach sufficient diagnostic filters for an Alexander teacher to be able to say, well, there are enough indicators here for me to say, you need to see the GP before I try um, Alexander technique. Because we all know that 80% at least of back pain is going to be mechanical and possibly transient. Yeah. And very few will have anything serious to worry about. But there are occasions when you'd need to recognize those That's true red flags. Absolutely right. And we have um, a doctor that comes in and talks to us about those particular yeah. red flags. Um, a, north, uh, a rheumatologist, mm -hmm. uh, a consultant rheumatologist that comes into us and discusses these particular red flags and says, if in doubt, refer. If yes. you're getting these sorts of things, waking up in the middle of the night with, with the, these sorts of pains, if you're getting these sorts of symptoms, suggest to your pupil that they go and have it checked before you actually carry on working mm. with them. Yeah. And do you have a relationship with GPs? I mean, do you, I don't how do I, how do I, I do. them all? Yes, I mean, do yeah, you well, get on well with them? Do they understand yeah. the depth of your knowledge? About I have probably more relationships with um, osteopaths, actually. Mm -hmm. Lots of good okay. relationships with osteopaths who I've um, been working with and we, we refer backwards and forwards for the last 30, 35 years. So you think osteopathy yeah. works well with the Alexander? I think it's a fantastic discipline and works very, very well. Uh, the diff mm -hmm. the, there are major differences, of course. Uh, we, we don't see ourselves as treating symptoms. We see yeah. each, uh, ourselves as learning self-regulation, learning something about ourselves that we can yes. put into practice in daily life. Yes, I and suspect uh, there's, a, there's a few people in the audience who said, well, we don't like to treat symptoms, we treat the whole body, because we all, we're all holistic uh, these days, yes, and some yes. more than others, but yeah. yeah, we try not just to treat the symptoms, but I do know what you mean. Yeah. Somebody actually sent in a very useful observation that yeah. what you were describing earlier on is what a lot of osteopaths would call um, listening to the body, yeah. which sounds to me as though what you with a gentle placatory um, approach we'll be doing. And, and I do apologise, we're talking a lot about osteopaths. Chiropractors, do feel free to send in your observations as well. It's not that we're biased. Uh, do, do you work with chiropractors? Or? The same, yes. Yeah. I've worked with chiropractors and osteopaths over, actually since I've been in central London, since yeah. uh, 1987. Yes. Yeah, and do you, do, is it your perception that actually there is a lack of awareness about Alexander Technique amongst those professions? Obviously the people you deal with will know a bit more about, them, about it. I think uh, osteopaths, certainly in central London, that I've come across are quite aware of, uh, of the Alexander Technique. Uh, one thing about uh, what you were saying before about um, uh, listening, yes. I do the best I can not to use listening hands, but communicating hands, and there is okay. a difference. Yes. So communicating is, the, is, is my intention mm -hmm. towards 
the person I'm working with. Listening hands, if I can exaggerate in a sort of a caricature, is like a stethoscope. What's happening there? Mm. Again, that would change yeah. the quality of my attention. And I want my attention to be expansive yes. rather than yeah. a narrowing, concentrated listening. I don't, want to, I don't want to promote a listening type of communication through, through my hands. Yeah. We've had a question. You've mentioned stress previously yes. as being a buzzword, like yeah. mindfulness. Yeah. But someone actually has sent in a question asking how you deal with stress when you're treating. Mm. You must come across it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and do you have specific techniques, for example, that you use when a patient is irritating, they've asked? <laughs> irritating me? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yes, the heart sink patient type. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I would say over time, over a three-year training period, I would have to master my own irritations so that, and of course I'll be irritated, and of course there'll be moments when a, a pupil will come in late, and there'll be times when a pupil will say or do something rather irritating. Of course, I'm human. But what I will have developed over a three-year period are personal skills, and perhaps some of the most important personal skill I hope I will have developed to a certain degree is the skill of inhibition, which is the ability to experience life, upsets, sadness, irritation, frustration, but without my sympathetic nervous system activated, which is an interesting idea. Mm. How can I yes. keep my head while all the rest are losing theirs, you know, the, yeah. the, the poem. And I would hope that over a period of time, I would be able to experience irritation, but for that not to translate inside of me into a stress pattern that would then diminish the quality of my touch. Mm -hmm. Again, same thing like stage fright. Of course I'll be anxious. I was anxious coming in today. Why not? But if it makes me paralyzed, I would say that my levels of inhibition would be less adequate for coping with this encounter. Yeah. Well, I'd have been a lot more anxious about this evening if I'd realised until a minute before we went on air that you used to be a TV news producer, which makes That's me right. and my small team <laughs> feel rather on the spot. And hope uh, that we're getting this 30 all right. years ago, so <laughs> I've forgotten it all. You're very the technology is very different. So yeah, yeah, and it's very good, you said, so I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, well, we talk, you, you consult, it says in your, on your website, to industry and to medical organisations. How does that happen? Do you offer your services out to them or do you just know people who think that you might be helpful to their workforce? And what do you do when you get in there? Okay, I can, uh, from the very simple to the more complex, I can go into, a, uh, into a, an office setting and I can assess the way they've got their workstation set up. Right. You know, simple ergonomics, which isn't really a hundredth of the skill I've got, but I'll do it if someone wants me to go inside uh, well, an office Can I pause you on that yes, one? Of because yeah. we've actually done um, one of these broadcasts on ergonomics, and we went to the Herman Miller uh, factory down near Swindon, I think it is. Are the chair people? Yeah, the chair yeah, people. Ex and excellent chairs. They're excellent yes. chairs. They're bloody expensive, but they are excellent chairs. But they put a lot of thought into ergonomics. But when it boiled oh. down to it, actually oh. the ergonomic advice wasn't far beyond the standard handout of height of the, right. the keyboard, height of the, um, right. the, the monitor, and so on. That's right. So do you feel you've got a bit of extra to add into that? Or? Well, I can do the standard stuff like I'm sure you can too, which really is a, is a drop in the ocean. Yeah. Because the most important thing isn't how expensive your chair is. I mean, a Herman Muller chair, I happen to like them. I like web chairs. I think they're yes. excellent. But you can have the best chair in the world, and if you're in a state of heightened anxiety and your flight fight button is being pressed and you've got adrenaline and cortisol streaming around your system, yeah. then the best chair in the world isn't going to save you from the ravages of postural troubles hmm. or RSI. Yes. You know, I know the RSI prevention uh, board suggests that of course you have to have the right height for your arm and the right screen distance and so on, but I'm sure you and I would agree that it's much more complicated than that. So I also assess how they're coping, what, so I ask them personal questions, I see how, how they're adapting themselves to the demand of their work environment. And if necessary, I'll say, I think you should come off and have a few individual Alexander lessons. Right. So no, it's, it isn't simply about workstation. Uh, today is a big craze about the, the standing desks, isn't yes. it? Yeah. And I think that's very sensible, yeah. because you're moving. You know, the idea of sitting in front of a screen being magnetised into this yes. 
the screen. It's not good for anybody. Well, there, there, there are a number of those sort of evolutionary cartoons, aren't there, of how people have morphed from being the, the caveman bent over at the waist to erect and then sitting at desks and meaning forward to the right. computer. That's why they're saying sitting is the new smoking, I think, is the new... Oh, possibly, is the, yes. <laughs> we, had, we did have a chap called John Graham came on to uh, one of the broadcasts some time ago, and he's into technological physiotherapy rehab. So oh, he's yeah. got robot legs for um, patients who are paralyzed from the yeah. waist down and all sorts of things like that. And one of the things which he brought out there, which I, th I found was a useful reminder, he said, well, for someone who's been in a wheelchair for however many years, the very fact of stretching the body out like that does wonders for the digestive system as well as you know, their, their uh, mental well-being. So it's hugely useful to, to find the right posture for the person. And I think what you were driving at a moment ago is that there is no, you can't force someone into what you say is the right posture and what Herman Miller says is the right posture. It's, there is a certain amount of individuality in all this, isn't there? That's right. I think you can use a good Herman Miller chair and say, well, your back is this long and you'll probably need a back length of the, of the chair this long. Where's your lumbar curve? Well, we'll, we'll put a, a lumbar support around this sort of angle and so on. I think you can do those gross things. Again, the height of the chair, which is adjustable to adjust to your legs. Those are simple things that I don't find very interesting. Um, but certainly, if you're sitting for a long period of time, it helps to get some support from the ergonomic environment. But for me, that is really not where the juice is. Mm. The, the, real, the real work I'm interested in is how the person, mind, body, is coping with the demands of everyday life internally, their own internal world, how they're coping with their own existential reality and how they're coping with their external environment yeah. as well. That it really has to be the issue and whether they're in a state of reaction uh, and activating the sympathetic nervous system, the flight fight response and all the biochemical and neurological and muscular skeletal changes that that will uh, develop yeah. or whether there's another possibility and Alexander is very much interested in developing the other side of the personality, the parasympathetic nervous system, the homeostatic potential yeah. of the human organism, the capacity for healing rather than disturbance. And that's the importance of the skilled touch from an Alexander teacher. So what led you down the psychotherapeutic route, that route then? And is that a common route for Alexander teachers? No, it's not particularly common at all. Uh, there's a handful, literally, of Alexander teachers who've gone, gone down the psychotherapy uh, road. Uh, I was particularly interested in psychotherapy. My first degree was in psychology when I was 18, so it's yes. not a, it wasn't a new thing for me. Yeah. I was always interested in, in, in psychology and uh, emotional healing. And then I went off and became a TV producer for a while. And a slight deviation, uh, opened up a vegetarian restaurant for a while, so there, there's some truth in the old hippie thing of being a vegetarian for a while, certainly yeah. was. Uh, came back again through uh, the Alexander Technique that I started in my early 20s. Yeah. And uh, then realized that actually, although my Alexander training was excellent, I didn't understand enough about the mind-body connection. And I wanted to deepen my understanding of the emotional components of, of, of health and how that impacts on the postural mechanisms. And does that mean that you're familiar with what has become another... It's not strictly a buzzword, but it's a very popular expression, which is this biopsychosocial model of health. I haven't come across that particular terminology. Right. I mean, but it's very, it's very popular in, in all forms of medicine that you can't simply prescribe a pill, crack a neck, oh, give some exercises. Yeah. You've got to deal with the psychological state and the, the social environment within which your patient exists. Um, I think exists. that's it. Yeah, well, that, that for sure. That yeah. for sure. I mean... Uh, and, 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 and I'm sorry up. to put you on the spot and, no, and find something you didn't know, but I'm sure that's what you did. No, the, the terminology I didn't know, but absolutely, yeah. because when I was growing up, we had a, a GP that came round to the house and they had a bedside, what we call a bedside manner. And that sort of attitude of kindness and interest and compassion yes. was very, very much part of the healing process, very much part of the healing process. And I think we've, unfortunately, we've, le we've left that behind a little bit. And uh, I think the interest for a lot of people who go to what's called alternative or complementary therapies is that they have time. They're listened to. Indeed. Yes. They're cared for. And um, that's a rare commodity, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and do you have particular tools that you use in assessing the psychological well-being of your... Um, I'm going to call them patients. You probably I'll wouldn't. call them pupils. You yes. call them pupils, yeah. 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 
But if I come to you with a with a back pain, let's let's yeah. say that's the case, um, I would think of myself as possibly being a patient rather than a pupil. And yes, and I would say to you, you can call yourself a patient, but you're going to learn something here. Mm. I'm going to teach you something about self-regulation, about managing your patterns of disturbance and yeah. distortion so that you can go away and build on your capacity for coping with whatever's got you into the state in the first place. And it won't be the model of you coming in here and I'll do something to you. And you go away saying, thank you, Anthony. If it comes back, I'll see you in a few weeks. I'd want you to come for a number of sessions on the trot so you develop a resource, and a resource that you can use with yourself and on yourself yes. as, as, as almost like a, a daily discipline. We wouldn't be able to conduct this discussion without talking about the evidence for the Alexander technique, because that's, of course, the basis on which we're all required to practice these days. Yes. But it's very reassuring to see that the Alexander technique is actually, I don't, is it nice recommended? Or yes. It yes, is good, yes. because there was a BMJ study in 2008, was there That's not? Right. And it was That's a right. pretty damned robust study. It was. And it's one of the well, largest we've done, actually. Yeah, yes, and yes. Were you involved? I wasn't, no. I wasn't one of the participants. Right. Uh, I was very happy that it was done because I think in evidence-based, uh, in the evidence-based world that we live in, it was very, very important to demonstrate uh, the validity of the Alexander Technique, the, its, its efficacy for back pain uh, in uh, comparison to a number of yeah. other modalities. So we were very pleased with that. And it certainly caused a, quite a, a spike in interest for the Alexander yes. Technique. And then, of course, a spike Dropped again. Which, which is a huge yeah. shame because, as I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as I recall the details of that study, interestingly that the, the summary of that study is available through the research pages on our website and when we post the recording of this broadcast we will put a direct link to it there plus a direct link to the full BMJ trial paper, uh, study paper. <coughs> but they had a control group arguably a control group, but it was, they received normal treatment for their back pain. It was chronic back pain that was yes, the, the topic, right. wasn't it? Um, so they went off to the GP and got normal treatment. So we want to know whether what you do can improve on what is the, the standard. There was a group which had massage. Yes. There was a group which had was it six sessions of Alexander and a group which had 24 sessions of Alexander. That's correct, yes. So they were nicely mm. grouped and there was something like 145 in each group. Mm. And some had exercise and some had didn't. So they were nicely randomised and they were nicely placed into these little groups, had a good control. And I thought the startling outcome from this, or the really good outcome, was that people who received massage for back pain, chronic back pain, got better. But it didn't last. People who had Alexander Technique, whether it was six or 24 sessions, got better and it lasted. At the one year point, and it was a good follow up mm. on this, yeah. they still had good outcomes for their, their pain. And it was only marginally less between those who'd had fewer Alexander sessions. So That's right. That's yeah. right. Sorry, I, I yeah. ran away with yeah. that. I mean, yes. And it's your no. topic. But I mean, You've done some good research. Well, there's yes. only one paper. It's not yes. hard to, to no. look through the details of that paper. Yeah. Are there more studies in progress? Not that I know of, not in, uh, no major studies, um, yeah. but uh, that was one of the largest I think we'll have um, undertaken for a while. There's a Parkinson study, which is uh, certainly worth a look at, right. but I don't know the, the details of it, but again, it shows its uh, validity and efficacy for Parkinson's. Okay, and uh, presumably it's been shown to be effective from yes. what you say, yeah. more effective than normal treatment or I, just as an adjunct to normal treatment? You've caught me on the hop because I don't know the control group. Right. I'm not sure what it was compared to. Okay, well, we'll dig out the paper and uh, we'll post yeah. it on the website afterwards because it would be interesting to see. Um, I've got some more questions coming in here, yeah. um, some of which we're going to come to. Some, uh, when somebody has asked for asked what you do with a patient, well, we're going to demonstrate that very okay. shortly, so yeah. we'll come back to that. Um, this is a useful one for uh, chiropractors, osteopaths, and so on. Where would you... Or could you give guidance on where to place Alexander Technique in an osteopathic treatment schedule as an integrated therapy or perhaps when they're almost better but not quite? Um, how do you fit it in? And, and that came from Alison. Thank you, Alison. Hmm. Well, I've worked with Alexander pupils simultaneously with them, them having osteopathy. And sometimes I've seen Alexander pupils where after a while I might suggest they go and see an osteopath. I've got no hmm. problem with that either. Uh, I don't feel that we're antagonistic in any way, uh, unless the osteopath gives certain exercises that I may not consider to be particularly helpful. And what do I mean by that? I mean, and this can be a Pilates practitioner, it doesn't just have to be a, mm. a, an osteopathic 
practitioner, anyone that gives uh, an exercise regime without considering the way that they are doing the activity. In other words, if someone says, well, I want you to just rotate and keep on rotating that shoulder around, and you can see that they're making a huge effort in their face and gesture, and that they're efforting something, I would say, well, that, as far as I'm concerned, goes against the whole principle of, 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 of non-doing, of, of, of gentle allowing, and um, would not be something I would recommend. So yeah. it depends on the sort of advice that's given outside of the osteopathic session, whether I would yes. see it as, as necessarily mutual. We do see in our practices, and possibly, and I'm sure you do yourself, um, a trait which I think is most common within the NHS, that exercise tends to be very prescriptive and drawn straight from the, the menu, from mm. the box. Mm. Um, if you come in, you're going to get your gluteus medius rehabilitated, well, or you're going it, to train yeah. your yeah. core, in inverted commas. Yes. Um, and is, yeah. that, is that something that you... Well, I think you've, you've raised a very important point. So people say, is exercise good? And it's, it's the wrong question. It isn't the exercise that's good or bad, it's how you're doing the exercise. Is weight training good or bad? Well, it can be disastrous or it can be a very appropriate way to turn up certain muscle groups. Yes. So I would always be interested. I'm interested in, in the psychology of how they're actually performing the act. But actually, if you watch people weight training, generally they will be straining because they're trying to lift as heavy a weight as they possibly can. I know, and I've seen too many casualties from that arena, so I'm not a great fan of overstraining when mm. they're weight training. But certain smallish weights that are, are appropriate, I've got no problem with yeah. at all. Again, how is it done? Same with yoga, same with any, same with swimming. Is swimming good for you? It's the wrong question. Swimming with the head smash, sna snatching back into the spine and like this, and, 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 the, yeah. and, and the struggling for breath and, the, and, 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 the, and the, the strain of the movements in the water clearly isn't good for anybody. Yeah. Same you... with running, same with jogging, same with anything. How are you doing the activity? It isn't the activity that's either good or bad. It's the wrong question. Right. So as part of your training, your own training, and the training you administer to other, play, other people, does that mean that you look closely at those different forms of exercise in order that you can say, well, when your pupil comes in and they demonstrate their running or whatever it is, you can say, well, you might want to try something different? I very rarely prescribed a particular activity or exercise. I'll say, what do you enjoy? Yeah. And if they're looking after themselves while they're doing it, and they're doing it in a state of ease, without activating the flight fight response, without employing certain muscle groups that yeah. are going to exacerbate the condition they've come in with. Yeah. If it's walking, if it's swimming, if it's jogging, I don't really care if it's horse riding, if it's yeah. yoga, no problem at all. Which yes. form of yoga? I'll leave it to you. Yeah. But if it's yoga where you're fighting so hard with a huge amount of ambition to get your right leg around the left hand, left hand side of your neck and causing yourself ruptures all over the place. I don't think that's such a great thing to do. Yeah. But if you're doing it, and that, what's, the, what's, the, what's the point of yoga? It's supposed to be done with a meditative attitude. Indeed. But how much of yoga is done with a meditative attitude okay. rather than ambition? And this is the point. You, we touched on this rather unhelpful word, mindfulness. Yes. But if yoga is done in a, in a mindset of ambition, of trying, of striving, of pushing and pulling and straining, that for me isn't, med is, isn't yoga anyway, because I don't mm. think yoga should ever be employed without the attitude of mind and body that should accompany it. Yeah. And I take that across the board with all okay. activities. Well, we've had three questions asking along the lines of, what's the aim of Alexander Technique? What do you actually do with a patient? And can we see a demo soon, please? So right. I think what we'll do now is we've, we've brought Justine in and you're going to go through your um, dem short demonstration of what yes. you might do yes. with, a, yes. with a pupil with Justine. Um, I'll leave you to do that now. Okay. And um, I'll interrupt if I think there's any questions from my point of view from the audience's point of view, but uh, for now it's over to, to be you fine. and Justine. Just before I move over to Justine, i just to, to say that the normal props of an Alexander teacher would include a, a table, looks like a massage table, yes. but it's not for massage, but it's a lying down, it's lying down work, and there'll be certain yeah. passive movements and, and guidance on a table, which we're not going to do here. So what it will, will do today is I'll, yeah. I'll give a demonstration of the movement side of the Alexander technique, where we use traditionally a, a stool or a chair as a prop, Great. and that's what uh, we will be demonstrating right now.